أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ادعو إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Previously we discussed two important points that the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring for nations to have coexistence and harmony among themselves We said the first point that Quran emphasizes on is diversity and variance and divergence in thoughts and worldviews. At the same time that Quran condones the people are entitled to have different opinions, alternative opinions from each other, at the same time it admonishes them for unity, to be unified. And the call is not only to Muslims, rather to entire human being, where it says, وَأَنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا وَأَنَا رَبُّكُمْ فَاعْبُدُونَ The call is to entire humanity. Ask them, exhort them to be unified, to have harmonious and peaceful relationship among themselves. To have to be united, but not at the expense of their free will. After all, this is how civilizations thrive and grow. Civilizations thrive when people have different ideas, multiple ideas, when they have diversities in views. At the same time, they live in harmony and peaceful way among themselves. At that time, you see civilization thrive and grow. Tonight, we will be talking about the method of choice that Quran has described in debating and discussing the points among different people, in debating between two opposing parties. When you and your counterparts have different opinion, an opposing opinion, Quran shows a method of choice in debating, in discussing these issues. The first point, it is illustrated in ayah number 23 of Surah 7, where the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ مَنْ يَرْزُقُكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ قُلِ اللَّهِ وَإِنَّ أَوْ إِيَّاكُمْ لَعَلَى هُدًا أَوْ فِي ظَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ The call is to the Prophet, who says that, tell, O oh you the Prophet, the Messenger, tell the idol worshippers of Mecca, tell them that either oh, us or you are either on the guiding side, on the guidance, or misguided. Either both of us are guided or misguided. The important point in this ayah is that the Almighty is telling his prophet and the prophet is the most noble creature that God has ever created the best among humanity the most perfect human being who has ever walked on the face of the planet yet the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him O oh Muhammad tell them that Either you and them are guided or you and them are misguided. Here is the important point, is that at the outset of any debate and discussion, you have no right to show that you have and control the absolute truth. You do not own the absolute truth. You should not be presumptuous and thinking and thinking that you are all right and good while your counterpart 
is all evil and wrong. This kind of debate is futile. This kind of debate is a fruitless. It will not get you anywhere. When you debate with your counterpart, with your opposing party, who has an opposing thought, an opposing opinion, you better discuss in a way that your thought is right, but also could be wrong. And his thought is wrong, but also could be right. You should be objective. You should, be, you should not be arrogant and presumptuous that you claim to have the absolute truth while your opposing party have the absolute falsehood. It doesn't work that way. Teaches, the Quran teaches the Holy Prophet how to start debating, telling him to be objective. The point of debate and discussion is not for the sake and for the sake of the debate and discussion itself. Rather is that both parties are objective. Both are in search of a truth. Both are looking for the truth. Therefore, when you start a debate, you have to be impartial. You have to be very objective in seeing the reasoning where your opposing party stands. Therefore, you cannot start the debate while you think you have owned the absolute truth and your counterpart is on the falsehood. You have to start all at a point that both are at the same level. And then you will carry the debate and the subject. In fact, Quran ridicules those people who claim that they are on the right path while they discredit others. For example, the Holy Quran mentions two religions, Christianity and Judaism, and ridicules both the Jews and the Christians for discrediting each other, for the notion that they believe they own the truth while their counterpart is at falsehood. And the ayah goes like this. It says, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودِ لَيْسَتِ النَّصَارَى عَلَى شَيْءٍ وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَى لَيْسَتِ الْيَهُودُ عَلَى شَيْءٍ كَذَلِكَ قَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ مِثْلَ قَوْلِهِمْ The Almighty scolds those two groups by denouncing the way of their thinking when they discredit their opposing party and claim that their opposing party does not have any ground of a truth while they are the one who possess all the truth. Quran ridicules and is called this type of notion. And then it says, كَذَلِكَ قَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ مِثْلَ قَوْلِهِمْ There could be some Muslims, but ignorant ones. Look at the description. The Quran is very specific and detailed oriented. It says, وَكَذَلِكَ قَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Meaning, O oh people who are glued to the TVs, when you see those channels, regardless whether they are followers of Ahlul Bayt or they are the followers of the enemies of Ahlul Bayt, whoever claims to have the absolute truth, this is a good sign for ignorance. Ignorance teaches us to be a presumptuous that I am only on the right track while others are on the wrong track. In debate, what you care for is to be objective and, 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 and debate the facts, debate the point in reference, not to be presumptuous, thinking that you are on the right track while your enemy or your adversary is on the wrong track because that kind of debate will not get you anywhere, will not be fruitful. Therefore, the Holy Quran warn against this fact. It says that do not start any argument, any debate where you consider yourself 
possessing the absolute truth while your adversary possesses the absolute falsehood. You may have big portion of the truth and he may have the big portion of falsehood, yet you cannot claim that you own the absolute truth. In fact, you would not know that anyone possesses the absolute truth until the day of judgment. Here is what the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where the Almighty says, فَاللَّهُ يَحْكُمُ بَيْنَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فِي مَا كَانُوا فِيهِ يَخْتَلِفُونَ God will decide, but when? On the day of judgment. Therefore, the first point in any debate, in any discussion you have with your adversaries is that you do not claim the ha do not claim having the absolute truth while your absolute your your adversary is on the wrong track this is one important point the second point that quran raises is the way you present yourself when you're presenting yourself you are debating not for the sake of debate in fact you are debating to win the heart and mind of your adversary. This is a strategy that you need to implement. Therefore, the ayah says, Ud'u ila sabeel rabbika bil hikmati wal maw'idati al hasana wajadilhum billati hiya ahsan. Three step strategy. Number one uses hikmah. Hikmah means wisdom, means knowledge. When you sit down with your adversary and discuss the point, number one, be knowledgeable. Understand the position of your adversary. Read your adversary very well. Do not base your judgment on rumors or somebody has said such and such. Go back to his own resources and read his own resources. You maybe have gotten the idea wrong to start with. Therefore, you have to clear your mind on the position of your adversary and the position of yourself. So number one, you need to use wisdom. The second point and the second step that you go forward, it says, hasana. When you advise, you better start with a nice way, with a good way, a pleasant way. Meaning that advice has two types of ways. One is a good one. The other one is a denigrating one, an insulting one. Quran says, choose the first one. The first one that you win the heart and the mind of people. Here the Almighty tells Musa السلام, He says, when you go to your enemy, Pharaoh, who's very arrogant, who's very ruthless, make sure that when you talk to him, talk to him gently. It says, اِذْهَبَا إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنِ إِنَّهُ طَغَىٰ فَقُولَا لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنًا When you talk to him, be pleasant with him. Speak nicely with him. This is the second strategy. The third one is when you go into argument. Choose the best. وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ you have bad way of debating, you have good way of debating, and third one, you have the best way of debating. The Almighty chooses the best way. When you speak to them, be very courteous to them. Be nice with them, be cordial, be respectful, even, their, even if their ideas is very blasphemous, is ridiculous, yet you have to be very mindful of respecting them. In another ayah, the Almighty tells us the end result of such kind of behavior. He says, وَلَا تَسْتَوِي الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا السَّيِّئَةُ اِدْفَعْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ The good gesture and the bad gesture are not equal. They are on two different levels. Choose the best one, the good one. Why would you choose the, bad one, the good one? Because of the result. فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةً 
you have an adversity that there is hostility and animosity among yourselves. You're killing each other. But when you present yourself in a best demeanor, in a respectful way, and you respect him, the same adversary, فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ He becomes very loyal, very loving to you. Then he said this secret, this type of argument is missing by the overwhelming majority of people. وَلَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا Only who have four bearings, only those who are patient can realize and appreciate this point. وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا ذُو حَظٍ عَظِيمٍ Someone who has the best luck, who have understood well, who has patience, can deliver this type of argument. Meaning that, unfortunately, the overwhelming majority of Muslims today and Muslim nations and Muslim governments missing them this point. They don't have the forbearance, they don't have the patience and the will to sit down and argue in civility and in mutual respect. يا كريم الصفح يا عظيم المان يا كثير الخير يا غديم الفضل يا دائم اللطف يا لطيف الصنع يا منفس الكرب يا كاشف الضر يا مالك الملك يا قاضي الحق سبحانك يا لا إله إلا أنت الغوث الغوث خلصنا من النار يا رب يا من هو في عهده وفي يا من هو في وفائه قوي يا من هو في قوته علي يا من هو في علوه قريب يا من هو في قربه لطيف يا من هو في لطفه شريف يا من هو في شرفه عزيز يا من هو في عزه عظيم يا من هو في عظمته مجيد يا من هو في مجده حميد سبحانك يا لا إله إلا أنت الغوث الغوث خلصنا من النار يا رب اللهم إني أسألك باسمك يا كافي يا شافي يا وافي يا معافي يا هادي يا داعي يا قاضي يا راضي يا عالي يا باقي سبحانك يا لا إله إلا أنت الغوث الغوث خلصنا من النار يا رب
come back again with the beautiful and eloquent Dua Joshan Al Kabir. Tonight we will cover segments number 34, 35, and 36. The theme for 34, segment 34, is to long for God's mercy. Where it says, Ya Kareem al Safh, Ya Azim al Men, Ya Kathir al Khair, Ya Qadim al Fadl, Ya Daim al Lotf, Ya Latif al Sun, Ya Munafis al Kurb, Ya Kashif al Dur, Ya Malik al Mulk, Ya Qadi al Haq. O oh, most magnanimous in overlooking sins, a greatest benefactor, great creator of subtlety, remover of pain, O oh, healer of injury, master of dominion, true judge. These are, again, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Kareem al Saf, Ya Azim al Man. God is the most forgiving. When you look at the verses in the Holy Quran, you will see an amazing thing. God promises, if you ask repentance and repent of your, from your mistakes, the same piles of mistakes and sins that we have accumulated throughout our lives will all will be changed to rewards. Meaning if you are minus 100 and you ask for repentance, and you repent and ask for forgiveness from the Almighty, the Almighty make those minus 100, if you are in the minus, He will make them positive 100. Those same mistakes and sins and crimes that we have done throughout our lives will be changing to hasanat, to good things. As the Almighty says, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا if you have faith and repent, God will transform those sins into good deeds. Who does this beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who would not only forgive our sins, forgive our misconduct, rather he will reward us for the same misconduct that we have done in the past and now we are showing remorse and repenting from. In another ayah, God does not even ask for repentance. He doesn't ask for you to come back to him and repent from your mistake, just to acknowledge his mercy. Oh, those people who had excesses on themselves, do not be hopeless from the mercy of God. God will forgive your entire sins. All your sins will be forgiven. Remember, here is no mention of repentance. Here is no mention that you will come in remorse and ask for forgiveness. Just the fact that you acknowledge the mercy of God, the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by itself, will entitle you that God will forgive you from your sins. Who's better and forgiver and more generous than the Almighty? In another segment, it says, Ya Kathir al Khair, Ya Qadim al Fawl. The goodness of God is in abundance, in ample, cannot be matched by anything. I will give you examples. We as a humans, we have two kinds of activities. One activity is in our bodies that we have control over. For example, I control the amount of food intake and a drink intake that I do. I control my movement. I control at what time I sleep and what time I wake up. These are in my hands. These are vital movements that are in my control. But then there are vital activities in my body that I have no control over. For example, the breathing when I am sleeping, the heart beats, the work of my liver and my kidney. Are those in my control? Absolutely not. When I am sleeping, when I am totally oblivious 
around, in, around my surroundings? Who takes care of those? Who controls those and make me alive? If I don't breathe for one minute or two minutes, I am dead. If my heartbeat stops for one minute, I am completely dead. Who keeps those activities alive and ongoing? It is the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I am sleeping or when I am walking, He is always in control, in charge, out of His mercy. That's why He is kathir al-khair. The ample of goodness of God cannot be matched by anything. Wherever you will go, you will see the goodness, the blessings and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second segment, segment number 35, and the theme is to strengthen, to strengthen the bonds with God. And it goes, Ya man huwa fi ahdihi wa fi, Ya man huwa fi wafaihi qawi, Ya man huwa fi quwwatihi ali, Ya man huwa fi uluwihi qareeb, Ya man huwa fi qurbihi latif, Ya man huwa fi lutfihi sharif, Ya man huwa fi sharafihi aziz, Ya man huwa fi izzihi azim, Ya man huwa fi azamatihi majid, Ya man huwa fi majdihi hameed. He, oh, he who fulfills his promise. He who is great in his might. He who is near everyone in spite of his greatness. He who is benign in his weariness. He who is noble in his benignity. He who is powerful in his nobility. He who is great in his power. He who is exalted in his greatness. He who is praiseworthy in his exaltation. The words, Ya man huwa fi ahdihi wa fi, Ya man huwa fi wafaihi qawi. The covenant between God and people. The contract between those two entities. Social scientists and economists tell you if you want to make a contract, between two people, it's better that both will be on equal footing, meaning both should have same leverage, same power, same strength in this mutual contract between themselves. Why? Because if one of them is weak and the other party is strong, then there is a fear that the stronger party will aggress upon the weaker party. But this is invalid in the case of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has made a covenant with us. We worship Him, we obey Him, we are obedient to Him, in return He will give us heaven. He will give us a successful life in this life and in the hereafter. This is a covenant and it's going either way. Despite the fact that God is the Almighty, He's the all-powerful, and we are the all weakest. Our power is unmatched by the power of God, yet He is very devout and faithful in His covenants. If we do not break our promises, God would not break His promise. He will continue with His promise as says, Ya man huwa fi ahdihi wa fi, Ya man huwa fi wafaihi qawi. The pledge that He gives, the devotion that he gives are very, very strong. This is in segment number 25. Segment number 20, 36, I'm, my apologies, segment number 35 that we just read. And then the last one is segment number 36. The theme of segment number 36 is to drive away evil, where it says, Allahumma inni as'aluka bismika, ya kafi, Ya Shafi, Ya Wafi, Ya Mu'afi, Ya Hadi, Ya Da'i, Ya Qadi, Ya Radi, Ya Ali, Ya Baqi. O oh Allah, I beseech thee in thy name, O oh sufficient, O oh restorer, restorer of health, faithful, forgiver, guide, summoner, judge, agreeable, high, eternal. These are beautiful attributes, Ya Kafi, Ya Shafi. God is the healer. 
وَإِذَا مَرِضْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ If I become sick, if I go through illness, he's the ultimate healer. My curement is in his hand. Also, he is wafi, muafi, wahadi. He's the one that is guide. He's the one who is faithful and forgiver. He guides us. Without his guide, we cannot be guided. We always recite this holy verse in the Holy Quran. You, the Lord, you show us the true path. You guide us toward the true path. He's the guide. He's the healer. But again, remember, the law of nature that God has designed has to take its natural course. Meaning, if I do not go to the doctor, if I do not take the proper procedures of healing, God would not bestow healing on me. I have to be realistic. I have to strive. I have to work hard. I have to go to the hospital. I have to see the doctor. I have to go under the harsh treatment of the doctor that he prescribes the medicine for me. At that time, you see the healing. Not from the doctor, rather from the Lord. This is how God has set up the stage of this life. Everything has its own apparent cause. And we have to take these causes. We have to follow on those procedures. I cannot sit in the corner of my house and say, Oh Allah, why didn't you cure me? Or I do not sit in the corner of my house and say, Oh God, why my family, my children went astray? You didn't guide them. Yes, God is the ultimate and absolute guide. Yet, He wants us to take the proper procedure that we take our children to the proper school. We educate them the right education, the education that get them to be guided. If I abandon my children and leave them, they venture and they fool around. And at the end of the day, I blame God for their misguidance. I should not blame anybody, anyone but myself. Why? Because God has shown us the road. He said, if you stay vigilant in teaching your children, in guiding them, in taking them to the proper education and proper schooling, then you will see that they are guided. But if you leave them abandoned, without any guide, without any chaperoning, then at the end, of course, they will be misguided. Why? Because this is the golden formula that God has set up. You deserve what you have earned. The ayah says, وَأَنْ لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى You do not reap anything but what you have sow yourself. You only earn what you have strove for it. You have to strive and work hard for that thing and then ask the guidance, ask the blessing, ask the ease of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you will see that God will answer you. In such holy night, we should strive for betterment, for fixing our souls and our spirits and guiding ourselves and our families. Then we ask the Almighty to help us in that, in that path to make us and our families guided. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. He who is sorrowful for this world is in fact displeased with the dispensation of Allah. He who complains of a calamity that befalls him complains of his Lord. He who approaches a rich man and bends before him on account of his riches, then two thirds of his religion is gone. If a man reads the Quran and on dying goes to hell, then it means that he was among those who treated divine verses with mockery. If a man's heart gets attached to the world, then it catches three things, namely worry that never leaves him, greed that does not abandon him, and desire which he never fulfills. Oh, <laughs>